here's where we're going to be in with the cardiovascular system, and especially the heart. So this is important to go through the heart anatomy and talk about the direction of blood flow through the heart. So this is really helpful for your laboratory section. Um, and again, you should know the real anatomy of the heart as far as cadavers, human cadavers are. So you'll see a lot of cartoons here, but you need to get down the flow of blood through the heart. And we'll go through that right now. Again, we'll learn about the components. The cardio means heart. Vascular is the blood vessels. Remember, arteries take blood away from the heart. Veins drain back. Now, not all arteries are oxygenated, but the systemic ones are. The ones that you're used to seeing. And oxygenated arteries appear or glow red when hemoglobin is bound with oxygen. So that would be oxyhemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin or free hemoglobin doesn't glow bright red. It's darker, it's bluish. So we'll go through, in this recording, we'll go through the anatomy mostly and some basics and talk about the blood flow through physiology. And other recordings, we'll go through the conduction system and then cardiac cycle. And then the factors that influence cardiac output and we'll see what that means. Uh, this is just a, a view of the heart from the inferior. And it's kind of like what a CAT scan would look like, actually, or an MRI from the slice. Here's the vertebral body. And this is up in the thoracic. So you can see that would be one of the thoracic vertebrae. Here's the spinal cord. And here's the heart. And the heart is in an area of the thoracic cavity called the mediastinum, which is behind the sternum and in front of the thoracic vertebrae. So it's kind of in the middle, and this is the mediastinum. So part of the lungs are in that mediastinum as well. So take a look at the anatomy. Again, you're always looking at anatomy from outside in, superficial to deep, or deep to superficial. And that's how you learn it. So this is showing the cartoon of the mediastinum. You can see the layers going out. Notice how the heart kind of goes over to the left, right about that fifth intercostal space. And the bottom of the heart, the pointy part of the heart is called apex. You'll see how the bottom of the heart is called base, uh, really the top of the heart in the anatomical position. But the apex is downward, facing downward to the left. And you can see that the, you're going to find out this is the right ventricle right here. And that kind of lays right on the diaphragm with the heart pointing to the left, the inferior part of the heart. And you should know the cavities, of course. There's a layer of visceral pericardium. And usually that's also called the epicardium. Just so you know that if you see this in other books or on Wiley, the visceral layer, the heart covering, is actually also called epicardium. And then you have an outer layer of parietal pericardium. And it's like a sac, you're going to see there's a sac outside all this, and it's called the fibrous pericardium, dense regular connective tissue. And in between the pericardiums are that is that cavity, and that's the pericardial cavity, which contains serous fluid. Remember, serous is outside the organ and tubes. Mucous fluid is inside the lumens of the tubes. So again, visceral pericardial is right tightly bound to the heart itself. Now, this is a pretty interesting way to look at the overview um, of the muscles. These the superficial muscles, of course, there's deep muscles, and they kind of have direction, like grain of direction or grain. And it's the way the heart pumps, like the heart's going to pump downward contraction and then upward contraction. So the Configuration of these muscle fibers give this heart this functional syncytium of contraction because you want to pump blood out of the heart. That's what happens. You know, you pump blood down into the lower chambers and then you pump blood out of the heart. And this all happens very succinctly and the timing needs to be actually perfect. So cardiac muscle, anything that's not epicardium, pericardium, visceral, or parietal, or endocardium actually lines the chambers of the heart. But the main part of the heart that we talk about mostly is the muscle part, and that's called myocardium. So we refer to myocardium, myocardial cells. 
You're going to have pacemaker cells that are muscle types that are very specific. And then you're going to have contractile working cells in the myocardium doing most of the work, which also have their own pacemaking potential, but most of the pacemakers in the upper part of the heart. And you'll see that. So again, the most important tissue in this heart that we're going to talk about is the myocardium. That's the cardiac muscle. And where it's most thickest, I'll give you a heads up. It's going to be the left lateral inferior wall of the left ventricle, a very thick myocardium all around here. Because this is where most of your oxygenated blood is going to be pumped to the rest of the body. You're going to see that. So endocardium lines the chambers inside the heart. And it's kind of important. I mean, that's simple squamous epithelium, which really you can't, you're not diffusing a lot of oxygenated blood into the myocardium. The myocardium, you're going to find out, is oxygenated via the coronary vessels, which you're going to learn. The right and left coronary vessels are off of the aorta. They don't come from inside the heart. The coronary vessels, the coronary arteries, right and left, are the vessels that feed oxygenated blood to the whole myocardium, all of the heart muscle. And then those coronary veins will return the blood back to the heart, believe it or not, into the right atrium. You'll see that. So some connections here. Um, you know, pericarditis, like is... Itis is always an infection or inflammation, and the pericardium can get inflamed. And this is a, this is a serious condition, uh, bacterial especially. It can be, be sudden onset, which is acute. And again, it could be viral as well. And, and that's, that's dangerous, but bacteria is really hard to control. Or it could be chronic, which has a gradual onset and builds up over time, and it's much harder to treat. Uh, myocarditis is inflammation of the muscle itself. And a lot of times that is viral. And endocarditis is inflammation of the endocardium. And that can be bacterial, which is really scary. And that, and that could be due to strep, or staph, which are both bacteria. So just get the idea of what these are. Myo, peri, endo, and itis is inflammation. And inflammation is a secondary to some type of pathogen attack. So here's the general view of the heart. Some of the main things like... And, and on the left here is your cartoon, and the right is the real anatomy, which you're going to have to know. And this is an anterior view. So I think you really should take note of the chambers. Like this is the right atrium right here. The left atrium is over here. Like the atria, like left and right, plural, is atria. They're small chambers, and they're on top. So they have these appendages, um, which are called oracles, and technically they are part of the atria they look like ears that's why they call them oracles like you can see it better here oracle but technically the chamber is behind that i think you'll see that in lab on the real anatomy so you have the right and left atrium which atria then you have the right ventricle and the left ventricle and the main vessels you're going to see and we'll go through this many times like right here, you have what's called the pulmonary trunk. Now, that's deoxygenated blood coming from the right ventricle. So that's a great vessel. So that's technically an artery because the blood's coming away, even though it is deoxygenated. And it's an artery because it's going to the lungs. And this is part of the pulmonary circuit, which is kind of opposite. Uh, arteries are blue, veins are red. Then from the left ventricle, blood is pumped into this vessel right here, which is called the ascending aorta, or just aorta is fine. And then it goes into this bending hairpin turn of an aortic arch. Now, the aortic arch has three branches. You have to memorize this. So the most medial branch, or the most to the right, is an artery called the brachiocephalic trunk. The one in the middle is called the left common carotid artery. So in lab, when you mention these and you do it in lecture as well, you have to say everything. It's left, common carotid, and it's an artery. And then you have the third one, most lateral or to the left, is called the left mm -hmm. subclavian artery. Subclavian means below the clavicle. So that's going to continue below the clavicle. So that's a couple of the great vessels. Now, uh, two great vessels you need to know always is the superior and inferior vena cava. So the superior vena cava is bringing back systemic deoxygenated blood from the head, the neck, the arms, and the upper torso. And that's going into the right atrium. 
The inferior vena cava receives blood from the legs and trunk and the bottom one third of the trunk, really. And all that deoxygenated blood systemically is going into the right atrium as well. So just so you know, there's three ways deoxygenated blood gets into the right atrium. One is the superior vena cava. The other is the inferior vena cava. And the other one is called the coronary sinus, which is all the deoxygenated blood coming from the myocardium via the coronary circuit into the right atrium. So one of the takeaways here right off the bat is you should know that the left side of the heart deals with oxygenated blood and the right side is dealing with deoxygenated blood. So the right side is blue blood, the left side is red blood. Now, right here, you can see these vessels are taking blood to the lungs from the heart. Therefore, they're pulmonary arteries. So that's a pulmonary circuit. Very important. They're not part of the vena cavas, and you'll see that once you get into the wiley. Now, these red vessels are pulmonary veins. Now, they're taking blood from the lungs. So they're both sides, right and left, because there's two lungs. The left and right pulmonary veins are taking oxygenated blood from the lungs and bringing it back to the left atrium. Because remember, the left side of the heart is oxygenated blood. The right side is deoxygenated blood. The upper chambers are called atria, right and left atrium. And the bottom chambers are called ventricles, right and left ventricles. Remember, the specimen or the picture of the patient owns the anatomy. So when you're looking at something, you got to make sure you know that this is right and this is left. This is right and this is left. And you have to know it's anterior as well. It's not that easy sometimes with the heart. So definitely take note of the real anatomy here. It all matches up pretty well. Now, this is posterior view. And again, you can't see much of the um, right ventricle from the front, but you can see a good piece of it here. Now, now it's changed now. So this is posterior. So this is right and this is left. And so this is all left atrium. And these are pulmonary veins. Now, remember, this is pulmonary circuit. So veins are red, oxygenated. And arteries are blue because that's taking blood away from the heart. Remember, the definition of an artery is blood away from the heart. A vein is blood coming back to the heart, draining back to the heart. This is the right atrium. Remember, you have the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Here's the pulmonary arteries. Make sure you know that this is blood going to the lungs. It has nothing to do with the superior and inferior vena cava or the right atrium. Here's the... Um, aortic arch, you're ascending aorta. So remember, this is the right side now. So this is your brachiocephalic trunk. This is your left common carotid artery. And this is your left subclavian artery. You have to say all of that. You can't say one thing. You have to say common carotid artery, even though there aren't any common carotid veins. There are subclavian veins that companion these arteries. So you'll see that when you do blood vessels. So this um, vessel right here now is going to be called a descending aorta. That's going to go downward, descend through the thoracic cavity into the abdominal cavity. Like right here, you can see it. That's the descending aorta going. It's going to go through the diaphragm and then into the abdominal cavity. So here's some other things. Like this is the coronary sinus I mentioned before. So this is where all the coronary vessels drain deoxygenated blood in from the myocardium and puts the blood into the right atrium. And they have these sulcus, like I might not have mentioned it here, but there's like the space between the right and left ventricle is called the anterior interventricular sulcus. You're going to have a coronary artery and vein through there. And then you have a posterior interventricular sulcus where you have coronary arteries and veins as well. So take note of all these things, all these great vessels, all the atria and the ventricles. Here's the left ventricle. Remember, that's the thickest and the biggest the chamber, always, because that's got a lot of work to do. So here's the frontal section of the heart, anterior. And now you can see inside the heart. This is the most common thing uh, you'll see. And I'll make sure you match this up with the real anatomy. It's not easy. I mean, the pictures, the cartoons are really easy. But the sometimes when you look at the real anatomy of the heart. It's not so simple. 
So what first thing I would do is look at the chambers and you have the right and left atrium. And now blood is going to go downward into the ventricles. So there's a valve. Now there's four valves in the heart. There's two atrioventricular valves. And then there's two outflow valves, semilunar outflow valves. So you'll see them. But let's just talk about the atrioventricular valves. On the right, the valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle is called the tricuspid valve. And that's an atrioventricular valve. And you'll learn things in lab, like the valves have cusps. They're connective tissue. The valves are not myocardium. They're connective tissue, which is non-conductive. It's kind of an insulator for the electrical conduction system of the heart. The a AV valves, like this one is the tricuspid, has these cords called uh, chordae tendinae. And that attaches to a muscle, which is a smooth muscle called a papillary muscle, which attaches to the endocardium via these a trabecula carne. So you'll see all that. This is all anatomy. Now on the on the left side, the atrioventricular valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle, that is called the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve. It's called mitral because the cusps of the valve look like uh, the mitre of a bishop. So same thing, the left uh, AV valve, which is called bicuspid or mitral, has chordae tendinae. It has papillary muscles that attach to the trabecular carne, which is attached to the endocardium. So the, the reason we have valves and the function of a valve is to prevent backflow. Because you should know, and we'll talk about this more, that through the cardiovascular system, the cardiovascular system is a closed system and it's a one-way system. So everything has to be going the right direction. So while we're here, you notice um, the left side of the heart is mostly dealing with oxygenated blood. The right side is deoxygenated blood. There is no connection between the right and left side of the heart. There is a connection between the upper and lower, and that's through these AV valves. So the left ventricle is going to pump blood through a valve, which you really can't see too great here, the aortic valve. And the aortic valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. So it's the aortic semilunar outflow valve. So that's the third valve we learned. The other valve is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. And that's the pulmonary semilunar outflow valve. Note that the semilunar outflow valves do not have chordae tendine. And a lot of these valves are opening and closing due to pressure changes and blood filling. Because blood, what you should understand, let me see if it's a better picture here, Blood comes into the heart to the top. Like everything's coming into the right atrium and the right left atrium at the same time. So the left atrium is receiving blood from the pulmonary veins coming from the lungs, right and left lungs. The right atrium is receiving blood from the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. So the AV valves are closed, tricuspid and bicuspid are closed as they're filling and they fill at the exact same time. Because the heart contracts, first of all, it has to depolarize, which means sodium has to rush into these cell membranes and causes an action potential. So the vessels, I'm sorry, the chambers, the atria are filling first before the ventricle. They're depolarizing first, and then the valves will open, and then they will contract, pushing blood into the ventricles all at the same time. And then the, the AV valves will slam shut, and the ventricles what, oh, well, that happens after the ventricles are filled, of course. And then the ventricles will depolarize, contract, and eject blood out to the pulmonary circuit, which is the lungs, and to the systemic circuit, which is the aorta. And it all happens at the same time. So the, the cardiac cycle, which you'll learn in another recording, it's all about filling the valves, closing due to pressure changes, ejection, depolarization, and filling all over again. So the atria is the, the kick of the heart. That's where the pacemakers are. That's where the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular nodes and node in the atrial cells depolarize first. And that kicks kick starts the heart beat. And then the valves, the AV valves open, and then the atria contract, blood is forced into the ventricles, and then the AV valves close. That's half of the cycle. Some other parts just to show you here. Um this is a vestigial 
structure right here, which means it was once an open vessel before you were born. But once you're born, it becomes a ligament. Like it used to be called the um, ductus arteriosus, which is a duct between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Of course, you don't want that happening in somebody who's born. And if it does, you have to have surgery. So it becomes a ligament in the adult or in the, in the newborn, sorry, in the newborn. So that used to connect the two. And there's also something called a fossa ovalis, which is in the right ventricle. So this kind of is a septum between the right and left atrium. And that had a, a hole. It was called the foramen oval, so because you had oval and you had blood passing through the right and left side of the heart and you don't have that as a newborn. It stops. And if it does, if there's a septal defect, it has to be fixed. Sometimes that happens when the baby's born with a hole, they say, in the heart. It's because the fossa, oh, I'm sorry, the foramen oval did not close and become the fossa oval. This is really important. So right here, you have this big, big piece of myocardium and this is called the interventricular septum. So inter means between. There's an interatrial septum, right where that fossa ovalis is, but you can't really see it on this picture. So again, you can still see the, the trabecular carne. You can see the papillary muscles. Remember, papillary muscles are smooth muscle. And they really only contract to help the chordae tendon and keep everything in place. So as you can see, and it doesn't really show you that clearly in this cartoon, but in the real anatomy, you'll see the left ventricular chamber is huge compared to the right, and it's the muscle walls of the left is bigger. Like the left side of the heart is left, eight, left ventricle, that is. The left ventricle is not like, you know, Kanye West or Justin Bieber. The left side of the heart, left ventricle is like Jimi Hendrix. That's the rock star of the heart. That's really going to get the pumping going. Because the left ventricle is to pump blood to the whole body, where the right ventricle is just pumping blood into the lungs. And you can see that here. This is a, a top view looking down or looking up. It doesn't really matter. So this is the left ventricle. Look how thick it is compared to the walls of the right ventricle. And that's all it's showing. So again, in lab, you'll go through that. This is a nice view. It's an anterior, um, sorry, it's a superior view. This is anterior. So you can see the pulmonary valve. Because the pulmonary trunk is anterior to the aorta. And this is the aortic valve. So this is if you cut right through the atria, right at the bottom of the atria. And you can see this is the um, AV valve on the left, which is the bicuspid. And AV on the right is tricuspid. It, the tricuspid does have three cusps. The bicuspid does have two, but don't start counting these cusps because that would get confusing if you do this on the real uh, anatomy. Now, remember the valves and that function of valves is to keep blood moving in one direction. That's anterograde. You don't want backflow. So valves prevent backflow everywhere. But in the heart, there's the four valves and you need to know their names. You need to know where they are and you should be able to identify them in lab. So because the valves are not muscle, they're not excitable membranes, they are connective tissue. So they act as an electrical in insulator. And that's really important because you want to make sure that timing is perfect coming from the right atrium to the left atrium and then into the ventricles, the conduction system. Remember, the heart is autorhythmic. So it has its own pacemaker cells. And mo those pacemaker cells really are in the right atrium. Like even the ventricles have their own pacemaking potential, but you don't want that. You want the atria to start the pace of the heart. So I mentioned before pressure changes and the pressure is due to the way the blood is filling in the chambers. So when the blood comes into the right and left atrium, it builds up a pressure as the valves are closed. And once the pressure overcomes the pressure in the ventricles, then the AV valves can open. And that's preventing backflow. So once they close, when the ventricles are full, it stops the ventricular blood from backflowing into the atria. Because if it continues to backflow, the right atrium is going to back up into the systemic circuit, the systemic vein, which is going to cause systemic edema. If the mitral valve is insufficient on the left side, then the blood is going to back up into the left atrium, which could back up into the lungs, and then you're going to get pulmonary edema. Edema is excess fluid within a tissue, and it's inappropriate. Now, the semilunar valves, again, prevent backflow into the larger chambers, the, the ventricles. So the semilunar valves are outflow valves. Remember, the 
pulmonary trunk is anterior to the aorta. And the pulmonary semilunar outflow valve is between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. The aortic semilunar outflow valve is on the left side between the left ventricle and the aorta. So you should know if you have an insufficient valve, where's the backflow going to be? Like if you have back, uh, if you have an insufficient aortic valve, where would the backflow go to? That's right, to the left ventricle. And then the left ventricle could back up into the lungs via the pulmonary veins, and you're going to have pulmonary edema. Good deal. This is just an example. Take a look at the way these valves close. And when they close, that's when the papillary, these smooth muscles, contract. And they, they prevent, and the chordae tendon they attach to these heart strings. And that prevents the valve from prolapsing. Like if you've ever seen an umbrella go inside out on a windy day, that's kind of what a prolapse would be if it kept going. Like if the chordae tendon didn't hold the valves, the cusps down, then you'd have a problem. Yeah. So the aortic valve is probably, I don't want to stigmatize the other valves, but it's probably the most important because you really need that left ventricle to do all the work it needs to do. So, because when you talk about, you're going to hear a word called systole, which means contraction, and diastole, which means relaxation. And make moment, no mistake, when we're talking about systole and diastole and the systemic blood pressure, we're talking about left ventricular contraction and relaxation as opposed to right or atrium. So here are the valves. Once again, you can see the closed and open. When we do cardiac cycle, you could um, basically come back to this and, and hopefully you'll understand how this works. So I, I really like this because this basically tells you the flow of blood. And you, you can't, it, it all happens at the same time. Like the right ventricle and the left ventricle are ejecting blood at the exact same time. So you have to start somewhere, you know, when you're learning the the flow of blood through the heart. So, you know, you can compare, like, they always start with the right atrium, the deoxygenated blood, and then follow that the rest of the way, you know, through the, the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle, through the pulmonary semilunar outflow, into the pulmonary trunks, or pulmonary trunk, sorry, and then goes to the pulmonary arteries. And this is what you have to know. You really have to know that direction of blood flow. And then the lungs will oxygenate the blood in the pulmonary capillaries. Capillaries are where the actual um, gas exchange happens. You learn that in respiratory. So the oxygenated blood will return to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. And that's really important. And you can see that here. So you match it up. And here's the lungs. So again, if you start with the um, blood coming into the right atrium from here is the three ways it gets into the right atrium. And the right atrium goes through the atrioventricular valve, which is tricuspid, into the right ventricle. And the right ventricle pumps blood through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk and then pulmonary arteries to the lungs. And there's arterioles and then there's capillaries. Capillaries is where the magic happens, where CO2 gets blown off and oxygen comes back into the lungs, into the alveoli. And then the pulmonary veins will return blood to the left atrium. Now, there's no valve between the pulmonary veins and the left atrium, and there's also no valve between the superior, inferior vena cava or the coronary sinus and the right atrium. So know your valves. So left atrium has a valve below it called the left atrioventricular valve, which you know is called the mitral valve, also known as the bicuspid valve. And then blood goes into the left ventricle and then pump through the aortic semilunar outflow valve into the aorta. And you know the deal from there. You have the aortic arch, the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. And then the descending aorta will take the blood downward towards the abdominal area. Now you'll learn in blood vessels that the brachiocephalic trunk is going to branch to the uh, right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery and the right vertebral artery. And you'll see that. Because it's a little asymmetrical when you when you see how the heart is set up in the configuration of those branches off of the aorta uh, via the aortic arch. So here's an overview. This is a good thing to go through uh, for lecture and lab. Now the coronary circulation. I'm going to go through this um, quickly now because 
you want to know this for lab. This this is a recording that I'll, I'll prompt you to watch before you do the heart lab. So you should know one thing. This is the coronary circuit, and you have two arteries that come off of the aorta. Here's the aorta right here. So the first branches of the aorta are actually the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. And these are arteries. These are delivering oxygenated blood to the myocardium. These are extremely important. So you have the systemic circuit, you have the pulmonary circuit. Now we're talking about the coronary circuit. And this red is oxygenated and red is arteries. So just remember that. So you have these large branches of the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery, but the left coronary artery, artery has more branching and deeper branching. So there's a, a first vessel called the circumflex artery, which means circumflex because it goes around towards the back. Now this artery right here is the anterior interventricular artery. It's also known as the left anterior descending artery or the LAD. So this is feeding blood to this whole Jimi Hendrix area, right? This whole left lateral wall of the left ventricle and part of the septum and the inferior apex. So that's a really important blood vessel to the heart, uh, to the myocardium. In fact, if you heard of the term widowmaker, this is usually where there's an occlusion. Um, and a young person who has an occlusion that they don't know about, and then and if you have a, an ischemic attack where you have blockage, blood clot in that LAD, you're probably going to die from that heart attack at a young age because there's no um, no warning when this happens. There's no excess branching of blood vessels. When you get older, you get more branching. You'll learn about that. And the right side has a marginal branch. Sorry, I blocked that out a little bit of the coronary artery, the right coronary artery. So that's the main branch. And you'll see this one in the back as well. So in the, and then you can see which ones are in the back. Like you have the posterior artery, let me see what's on this page now. You have the posterior interventricular artery, which is in the back. I guess it's not really showing you too good here. Um, yeah, here's the anterior, here's the circumflex. Here's the right coronary, left coronary. That's good. You see the marginal branch and the anterior inferior ventricular artery. But here's the veins. Um, the, and this is anterior only. You have the great cardiac vein, which kind of goes along with the LAD, anterior interventricular artery. And posterior is the coronary sinus. And we saw that already. And then you have the small cardiac, anterior cardiac, and middle cardiac um, veins. These are veins draining back ultimately to the coronary sinus. Now, the anterior cardiac veins actually do drain into the right atrium, but for the most part, the main ways that the oxygenated blood gets into the right atrium is the inferior, superior vena cava and the coronary sinus. So this is, again, I'll mention this now, and we'll talk about this much more later, but Myocardial, now this is the heart muscle. Ischemia means decreased blood flow to this tissue. So the decreased blood flow, which is decreased oxygen to the myocardial cells, the myocardium. So you're going to get tissue reduction in oxygen. That's called hypoxia. So hypoxia is decreased oxygen in the tissue. Now, angina pectoris is pain. And it's usually along a dermatome, like your arms or your jaw. And it's a little different for women and men, so you have to pay attention to these symptoms. And angina pectoralis, uh, pectoris, is caused by ischemia. There's no doubt about it. So this is a heart problem. It's, just, it's a symptom. It's not a heart attack, so to speak. But it is. it precludes, make no mistake, this is precluding a possible heart attack. Now, heart attack is myocardial infarction. Now, that's necrosis. Or infarction means necrosis or death of the tissue because there's no oxygen supply. So the tissue will die off, and that's called necrosis. But it is called myocardial infarction in a colloquial term. It's the heart attack. And again, you have to, it depends on what caused the heart attack. It's usually a clot, and the clot is a thrombus. So you use a thrombolytic injection like streptokinase, which busts up clot. It's a clot buster. Or you go in with a, a catheter and you blow up the artery to make the blood flow through, and that's called angioplasty. 
or if you have to have surgery, you have to have a bypass. So a bypass is actually grafting a new, usually they'll take your great saphenous vein of your leg and bypass the bad artery and connect the blood right from the aorta to the myocardial cells. And it's usually the left ventricle, of course, because that's the most important part. So you remember this cardiac muscle tissue, um, it's branching, it has intercalated discs, that's the hallmark. There's a lot of T-tubules, which have to do with the movement of calcium. And in the intercalated disc, you have the gap junctions, which also is about ionic flow. And it's also connective tissue compartmentalizing this tissue, right? I mean, this is a nice buttress of connections so these cells can fire. And of course, you need a lot of mitochondria because cardiac muscle tissue relies heavily on aerobic respiration. And you've seen this. You did this with um, the heart. I'm sorry, with the skeletal muscle. And it's very similar. You see the sarcomere, A band, I band, Z disc. You see the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. But what you should know about cardiac muscle is unlike skeletal muscle, when it comes to calcium, the heart muscle relies more on extracellular calcium than it does the sequestered calcium that's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, where skeletal muscle is more involved with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And there's also thin and thick filaments. Remember, myosin is thin, as thick, sorry, and actin is thin. You still need to bind calcium to troponin. Troponin needs to displace tropomyosin off the binding sites on actin for myosin. It's all the same type of contraction. Okay, so what we've learned so far in this uh, slides is, is going to help you with your lab. So we'll move on in the next recording on more about the conduction system, cardiac output, and so forth.